It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce uh, Carlos Brito, who is our keynote speaker. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Anheuser-Busch InBev, the leading global brewer. <laughs> In Australia, that means he's, he's a reverential figure. <laughs> I'm reminded of my uncle who lived in Brisbane, Australia, and used to genuflect towards the Forex Brewery every morning uh, after he got out of bed. But um, uh, InBev is one of the, the world's top five consumer product companies. You have this thing, so uh, as I observed earlier, it's much easier for you to read it than for me to repeat it word for word so you know. Uh, the very significant thing uh, here is that uh, Carlos um, uh, has had tremendous amount of experience in uh, very senior uh, roles in uh, corporate management. He did his uh, engineering, engineering degree in Brazil and then he did, uh, most importantly, an MBA at Stanford in the earthquake year 1989. Carlos, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, uh, I understand that you would prefer to speak less and answer questions more, but we look forward to what you have to say, and uh, I hope you've brought along uh, quite a lot of uh, samples. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking for my glasses here, but I lost them somewhere. But it's okay. I still see it. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Thanks for coming. I'm here to talk about doing business in Brazil. Um, and I, I have some blocks of things to, to talk. Maybe it will last uh, 20 minutes or so. And then we'll open up for questions. Is that, is that, is that fair? OK, great. So first, let, let me tell you, I'm a Brazilian. So you know, I'm not, uh, I remember I went to a panel in New York the other day or two years ago about uh, Brazil. And uh, there was a, a round table. And I was the only Brazilian in the round table. Everybody else was Americans trying to talk about Brazil. Not that they couldn't, but of course, most of the questions were directed to me just because I, I was, you know, from uh, the country. So I'm Brazilian. I was born in Rio. Um, I'm 53 years old, 1960, so good vintage. And um, uh, <laughs> I work for Anheuser-Busch and Bev. That's... Uh, that's a beer company with brands like Stella, Budweiser, Bax, Corona now, Bud Light, Brahma, Skoll, Antarctica in Brazil, Bohemia, so many brands. And, um, and Brazil is a very important part of our business. I mean, it's uh, like 35% of our business, more of that in terms of growth. It's a growth en engine for us and has been for many years. I've been in the company now for 24 years. And Brazil has not only been a source of growth for the business, but also a great hub for talent export. I mean, we develop a lot of our great talents in Brazil. And today we have talents of ours in China and in India and in Canada, all over Latin America, where we have business in pretty much all countries, in Europe, uh, everywhere. So we, ex we use Brazil really as a hub for talent. I mean, the universities in Brazil, uh, there are some gaps about education that we'll talk about. But uh, there are some top universities in Brazil that really uh, churns great talent, and we're taking advantage of that. Um, I thought the second part of things I would talk to you about, and maybe somebody has referred to it already, is the amount of change that I've witnessed in my 53 years, or the last, mainly the last 20 or 25 years, or 30 years, rather, of my life uh, in Brazil, personally and in business. Just to give you uh, an idea of how much Brazil has changed. When I entered the business, uh, the beer business in 1989, so 24 years ago, uh, our, our, our P&L, if we were to look at our P&L and where we generated the, the money, you know, uh, it was not on the operational side of the business. It was on the non-operational side of the business. So when you do the traditional, you know, uh, revenue, cost of goods sold, goods profit, GNA, SGNA, ta 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 ta, net profit, that was negative. Okay? Or well, at least at the EBITDA line, it was negative. And then we would make up for that with the float of our cash in the bank via interest bearing accounts. So the difference between payables, receivables, inventory, so the working capital 
was the thing that would generate. Can, can, I mean, even I that lived through that, when I think of those days, I think, oh my God, that's crazy. I mean, so selling beer, soft drinks, water, was a negative, was a, a, a destroying proposition in terms of value. That is a destructive proposition, and we make up for it by the, 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 the days, the terms of payment we have with our suppliers and our customers and the amount of inventory we had and all that. So crazy, but that was it. Uh, inflation, of course, was very high. I mean, inflation was at, a, at its peak 80% a month, and today it's five or six a year. So, I mean, again, huge change. Prices were controlled. When we started in the business, we had to go to the central government, to the federal government, to ask for a price increase. We had to come with the famous cost you know, worksheets and try to convince them that uh, there were cost pressures and that we needed the price increase. And they would, depending on, on the day, would agree to it or would agree to half of it or whatever. So that was the business. And then price got deregulated. Um, Pity I don't have my glasses. I don't know what I did in my glasses. Does anybody have a reading glasses? That would be very helpful. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, um, foreign exchange control. I mean, you couldn't send money abroad. I mean, pay dividends. So for some multinational companies that were in Brazil, they, they had issues. They had also to have special authorizations today. That doesn't exist anymore, no price controls, inflation low. The IMF was all over us, International Monetary Fund, right? Coaching us, telling us how to run the country. And today we have reserves of 300 plus billion. I'm not an economist, but that's what I read. And uh, we have even the credit position with the IMF. So I mean, in my lifetime, I don't think, I never thought I would see that. Uh, the market was closed. I'll give you an example. When I came back from the business school, uh, I went to business school here, uh, class of 89. So between 87 and 89, I was here. And I, at the time, I, the Brazilian regulation, Brazil was a closed market. You couldn't import hardly anything, or you couldn't import anything. And I, I was able to bring a computer with me, an AT-286. I brought that computer with me. That is the only thing I brought other than my clothes. And I went to work for Brahma. Um, and at Brahma, because they couldn't import, all they had were... XT computers, you know, the old XT, I think that was the name. And I was the financial, I was a financial assistant and we had a modeling that we wanted to, to implement in the company to, because of the inflation, we had to have a parallel system, a managerial system to, to not to look at historical costs, but at replenishment costs, you know, to get the true margins, you know, that whole thing of the high inflation countries. So we implemented that, but in order to test that, we had to go through runs and runs to see if the if the software was re responding. I would do that at my house because my AT, you know, with the, the, the speed of my AT processor, I could do like 10 runs in the same time that the XT. So I had a better computer than the whole company, you know, than anybody in the company had. Just, just to give you an idea of how strange it was to, to run business in Brazil. Um, the middle class. I mean, if you look today, what happened in Brazil, I mean, inequality remains an issue. Like today, even in the U.S., people talk about inequality. The power of information made it even worse. I mean, the ones that have the information are more and more to the top, and the other ones that don't have it, their salaries don't increase. In Brazil, we're seeing the middle class booming. You know, uh, people that were not in, in, in consuming, they are now consuming. They are buying things they never thought they would buy. They, they, they are buying cars. I mean, consumer credit is another thing that changed in Brazil. I mean, I remember in my days to buy a car, you had to buy cash. I mean, something that when I came here to business school in 87 and I tried to explain that to my colleagues, nobody could, what do you mean cash? I mean, you know, what about credit? What about uh, zero money down and uh, zero interest, whatever, you know? Those days interest was not so low, but, but uh, today, I mean, you can buy a car in five years, so the cars get destroyed before you even pay for it and the car is gone. So, it was a dictatorship, and today's a democracy. So uh, I remember when I came here in 87, I was called at the Bechtel, Bechtel Center to talk about Brazil. And all the questions were about the burning of the Amazon, you know, the high inflation, the fact that we had issues with the, monetar the, the IMF, and uh, dictatorships or things like that, or press that was not totally free, and, 
and things of all sorts of questions. I mean, it was not so cool to be a Brazilian in those days, in, 80, in, in 87. Today, I mean, in Brazil, if you buy a piece of land and there is a tree and you want to cut that tree, you can't. I mean, it's your tree. Here in the U.S., I bought a piece of land. I cut all the trees. Nobody could care less. They are my trees. I cut the trees, and then I plant some others. The other day, we had uh, we were we were going to build a brewery, a, a new brewery, a huge brewery, generate jobs, tax collections for the state of Minas Gerais, one of the three top states in Brazil. The project got delayed six months because we had to cut ten trees, and those trees were of some, you know. Uh, species that was, uh, um, you know, not found everywhere. And we said, okay, for each one we'll plant a thousand, you know. And it took six months discussing ten trees. So, I mean, that's how the pendulum thing. So, from the burning the Amazon, I'm not saying it's perfect in the Amazon, but from going all the way to you cannot cut a tree, that's a crime. Okay, so, different country. Consumer credit. I remember when Walmart came to Brazil, it came in the partnership in 1994, before the stabilization plan, with some of our board members. And uh, Walmart came and they said, no, no, we're going to do business in Brazil the same way we do in the U.S. And, uh, and, and, and my talk here is about doing business in Brazil. So they came to Brazil and said, no, no, well, I mean, we are the biggest retailers in the world. Brazil is a big market, so we're going to do business here. And in Brazil, because there was no consumer credit, because there was still high inflation, one uh, available form of credit was what was called the predated, predated check, right? So, I mean, your salary would come at the end of the month, and, uh, you know, on the 20th of the month, your salary was gone, was gone, pretty much. So you would write a check, buy something, and tell the guy, okay, th this check is good for the 30th. So you hold on to it, and you deposit on the 30th. That was credit, right? At Walmart said, no, for us, it's cash check but to be deposited tomorrow or credit card that's it and and they lost a lot of sales because of that and then of course they adapted they learned and everything they now are very successful in brazil but just to give you a feel of how different the place was um so today it feels good to be a brazilian you know and maybe two years ago even better but <laughs> but today it still feels cool to be a brazilian uh compared to the time when i went here when i came here for business school and I, I often, I'm very connected here to the business school. And I, yesterday I gave a talk there about, uh, you know, leadership and all that. And that, that was, that time, and this is the third time I do it, that time they didn't ask this one question that they normally ask, which is, what should you get from the business school experience? And what I normally say is that in those days, what I got was two things. First, uh, my, my bar was up big time. Because when I, was, when I was in Brazil, I went to the best schools, I went to the best universities, and I was top, uh, I don't know, 10%, 5% in all these places. And uh, when I came to Stanford Business School, I was average. And that, for me, was a huge shock. And that, for me, opened a big gap. And instead of demotivating me, motivated me. But also was a wake-up call. I said, man, the world out there is not this protected place where I live. It's a tougher place. Um, People are very smart, and I'll have to up my game big time if I want to compete in this world. And the second thing I learned at business school is that being a Brazilian was something that could be overcome. And that, at that time, I thought it was a liability because all people talk about Brazil was bad, and, 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 and indeed most of them were right to, to say because things were facts. And I had a sense of inferiority uh, coming to the business school because I was the only Brazilian uh, in my class. And that was a, um, pretty much every year they would take only one Brazilian at the Stanford Business School here. And all my colleagues, 85% Americans, 15% foreigners. And uh, I thought everybody that spoke English better than I, than I did uh, uh, was better than I was uh, because they could present better in the class participation. They were better. They were taller. They had more hair. They were, you know, they played sports that I couldn't play. I don't know. I thought they were better. And through business school, I learned that despite the language, unfortunately, we, we speak Portuguese, which is a language that's not all important. I wish we spoke Spanish in Brazil, which is a much more important language in today's world, but we speak Portuguese. And, um, but other than that, we can compete. I, I said, you know what? I can compete with my American friends. You know, I don't have a problem with that. I learned that. And that gave me a lot of confidence to be more of a world citizen 
as opposed to a Brazilian-centric person. And I think the, to summarize this all, yesterday I was talking to the head of admissions at the business school here, and he was telling me that this incoming class has 15 Brazilians, one five. And when it was here, it was one. And Brazil, together with China and India, is the third biggest feeder into the business school in the last few years, other than, of course, the U.S., in terms of international students. So, I mean, you know, talk about black and white, you know, that, that's what we've lived in Brazil. But let me now talk about uh, one thing that hasn't changed. So, I, I told you about all those things that have changed. But one thing that hasn't changed is in terms of the way I look at Brazil and the way our company, our group of shareholders and, and investors look at Brazil is that we've always been very bullish about Brazil and we remain this way. We remain bullish about Brazil. And uh, what are the reasons for that? I mean, a couple of things. First, the people in Brazil. Hardworking people, you know, entrepreneurial. There are some statistics about uh, the level of entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship in Brazil much higher than many countries so people want to do things it's just that the environment was not conducive because there was no credit because there was too much regulation it doesn't that but once you 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 get these people free up, freed up from all those 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 ties those knots you know you see that they 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 try things they start companies they create jobs they do things so that's a great thing it's great to work with people like that again it's a hub for us for our company to export best people and best practices demographics of brazil young people growing so for consumer products great place to be it's not an aging population will be one day but it's still growing and uh, for many years to come natural resources very important brazil is a powerhouse in terms of agriculture mining oil included. So, I mean, it, it has many advantages. I remember once I, I went to the Northeast to visit the uh, irriga irrigation process uh, uh, project in Petrolina, Pernambuco. And uh, I was stunned when they told me that they don't like rain because they have irrigation. And they said, all we want is what we have here, sun. All we want is sun because the, the, the land we can correct with the, the stuff we add through the nutrients we add through the irrigation. And the amount of water through irrigation is the one we want. When it rains, it kind of disturbs the equation. So we don't like rain, we like the sun. And the sun here is 330 days a year, and that's what we need. And that's why we have two crops a year, and sometimes two and a half crops per year, as opposed to other countries that have one crop a year. So it's a powerhouse, it doesn't depend on the government, totally done by private individuals, no subsidies. I mean, so it's a powerhouse. And mining for all the natural resources and the obvious things we all know. But more than that, it has an amazing domestic market now. So when China is booming and commodities are in high demand, great for Brazil. But when China kind of, you know, goes down a little bit, again, you have a domestic market. So if you're an investor, you have that, that hedge. Because when things are going well and the world's in a good mood, Brazil is connected to that world. There are more jobs and more money in the economy. When the world's in a bad mood or not growing as fast, you do have that domestic market, low unemployment, and all that. Other thing, there is a rule of law. I mean, we operate in many other countries, many, many countries. I mean, with, with the exception of Africa, we operate pretty much everywhere. And the rule of law, even when you talk about the BRICS, it's something that you can't take for granted. I'm not saying it's perfect in Brazil, but in Brazil, if you want a patent, if you want something, I mean, yes, you can go to the courts and make it, you know, uh, stand. So the rule of law, free press, so strong institutions. You go to Argentina, where well, we have business, there's no free press. You can't send money away from the country, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, our neighbor. So, and Brazil today is top five or top six in any you know, talk about TVs, cars, I mean, uh, gadgets, electronics, I mean, you name it. It's, it's their top five, top six. So it's, uh, um, but there are some gaps. There are some gaps that I'll talk in, in, the, in two blocks from, in the, not the next block, but the, the one after that. So for us, again, it's up. I mean, we don't see any reason because it has been up even in much tougher times. So our view of Brazil is it's up. 
but it's up with ups and downs. There will be good years, bad years, better governments, not so good governments, but at the end, the institutions, the country, the private will, will be stronger than that, and it's up for sure. That's our opinion, that's why we're bullish about it. The thing about uh, foreign investors in Brazil that we've seen in the past is that sometimes when there is a bad year, or there's a bad, a bad political you know, situation, or something is locked, or they get scared and they leave, and that's because they were not, they come from Switzerland or they come from the US where things are a straight line. But if you're born there, you know that it's up, that yes, there'll be good days and bad days, but it's generally up. So you should go and stay. For example, one of the best investments, I mean, we grew our company a lot through organic growth, but also a lot through mergers and acquisitions. And one of the best deals we've done was in 2001 and two, when Argentina was having an, an, an amazing crisis Everybody was leaving the country, but we're coming in. Because again, we take a long view. We knew it was up. I mean, now it's going through again, one of those soul searching moments. But again, it's up. And yes, there'll be one year, two years, but then it's up again. So you need to have that um, peace of mind and hold your breath because in adapt the operations in the bad years, because in prepare for the good years, because they will come, because it's up. So again, when I look today at what it's being said about Brazil, it's funny because being a Brazilian, what was strange for me was the last 10 or 10 years or eight years in which everybody thought that Brazil was perfect. That for me was strange because uh, yes, it's a great place and I, I'm saying I'm bullish, but it's not perfect. Like any place it has gaps. So, but today what they write about Brazil is also, it's the pendulum, not the opposite. Now everything's bad and it's totally untrue. Because if you look at the numbers, I'm sure there are economists here that will share. And, and, and yeah, yes, there's also some accounting issues you can look at this way, that way. But if you look at the numbers of the economy, the economy is not what people try to portray in some news rags and, and magazines and stuff. So it was not perfect. It's not what they say today. It's somewhere in the middle. And for us, for sure, up. So like any Financial markets, they tend to overshoot one way or the other way. So what are the opportunities? Uh, despite being very bullish, I recognize, and our company recognizes that there are clear opportunities. I'm not going to say anything to you that's a, a total uh, piece of new news. But infrastructure, for example, a couple of things here. Infrastructure is a clear gap that we have, clear gap. I mean, we see that because we are in a distribution business. Uh, with our beers, soft drinks, waters, juices, everything. So the roads, the warehouses, the, the ports, imports, exports, we do that too. So that's a clear gap. And that, uh, I was in a, in a, in a talk that uh, Guido Mantega, our finance minister, gave in New York at Goldman Sachs some uh, weeks ago. And um, he's doing the right thing. I mean, he's trying to attract investors to help bridge the gap in infrastructure. It's been done the Brazilian way, which sometimes is not the most straightforward way, but I think the intention is there. Uh, the recognition that it's needed is there. Uh, it's just a question that sometimes the process takes a bit longer just because, of, uh, because it's Brazil. But again, uh, it's being tackled. I think education is another gap, and sometimes not at the very end. I think, as I said, Brazil today is a hub for us to, for global talent. We export a lot of talent out of Brazil, out of operations, and they went to Brazilian universities. I went to a Brazilian university and, and I was able to get to, to Stanford Business School. So I mean, we have some great universities there, but that cannot be said about uh, the, the more the, the mainstream type education. You have some elite schools, but the mainstream has gaps, and I saw the program here, I'm sure it will be tackled. And that is, uh, cost to companies because when you hire people you have to train them or retrain them or sometimes it's it's tough to find that specific uh, uh, person for that specific very um, thing so you need to train that or, or, or take from, from some other place so education is a gap together with infrastructure I think another gap is security I mean the whole thing about security I think that's also part of what we call the some people call the Brazil cost Right? So education, security, infrastructure. Security, yes. I mean, 
you know, if you if you've been to Brazil, you know that uh, one of the items in the in the um, middle class basket, shopping basket, is a bulletproof car. I mean, it's uh, it's sad, but it's true. So I mean, you have to watch out, but you can have an amazing life in Brazil. I mean, I all the expats I know that have lived in Brazil or live in Brazil, they don't want to leave. Because, I mean, once you change the chip and you put the Brazilian chip in and you adapt to situations, and like in Mexico, like in so many other places, we have business in Paraguay, Bolivia, you know, you have to change the chip. But once you, 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 you change that chip, life can be amazing and, uh, and very rewarding. But security uh, is part of that Brazil cost that... Um, has to do with uh, the country being competitive and all that. So it's something that goes against that. The other thing is uh, a whole bunch of reforms that the government needs to, to undertake. So you talk about uh, the tax code, the fiscal reform. You talk about uh, government sponsored, like you have here in the US, Medicare, Medicaid, the, the Brazilian similars, and Social Security. I mean, those programs, need, they need to be reviewed the funding of those programs. But again, I'm not an economist. I'm sure there will be, will be people here that will talk more about this. I'm just talking from a, bit, uh, a point of view of somebody doing business in Brazil. Um, on the other hand, because we're very bullish, uh, we recognize also, because it's a fact, that the government's very open, especially this last year, to talk to private companies and listen what they have to say. So our company in Brazil has been very involved together with our sector. They don't talk to companies. Let me correct that. They talk to sectors because they want to hear, because they want to get the economy growing again. They want to get the, 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 the country to be more competitive. So they are listening, and, uh, and that's very good. I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, our, um, the beverages, beer, soft drinks, got taxed heavily in the last two years. We passed that through to prices. Consumers felt the pressure. Volume went down, tax collections went down. We sat with the government and said, I think you should delay this next tax increase. That was for this October, because you know this is going nowhere. And we can do what we did some four years ago, in which you gave us a tax break for the full year. So we had stability, we invested, we created jobs, you expanded your tax collections, and everybody was happy, and not even inflation we impacted because we didn't increase prices in terms of the tax pass through. So they are willing to listen, and they are, and they have the power, of course, to, to, to change things as they go on. So I think before we open to Q&A, I think all in all, uh, very bullish about the country. It's up, no doubt. Everything is there. Um, there is some things that needs fixing in terms of gaps, but that won't, that will be fixed. That will, is being tackled. We have two important events that will accelerate some of those things. The World Cup next year, which is a Brazilian passion, soccer, and uh, the Olympics. So that will be good because it will push a lot of this infrastructure uh, gaps to be closed. And I think my last point would be to say that Brazil is too big to be ignored. If I were a foreign investor, that's what I would tell a foreign investor. I think Brazil is too big to be ignored. And just today at the Advisory Council, I almost revolted. Because somebody was saying, oh, yeah, in, the, in Latin America, we're trying to develop this thing. We, we have this, uh, what professor was saying, we have this brilliant thing that we're going to do with uh, Chile. You know, say, come on, guys, wait a minute. I mean, Chile, I mean, Chile is the, the size of Sao Paulo. I mean, come on, give me a break. I mean, Brazil is 10 times bigger than Chile. But, yeah, but, but, but you know, some countries, they have this uh, marketing ability that they market themselves in a way that people think, oh, my God, it's amazing. You know, Chile. And then uh, you, you, there's an elephant here, Brazil, just walking past you, and you're trying to get the ant, you know, which is Chile, whatever. So, I mean, I, I think it's amazing. I think uh, as Brazilians who haven't been so good at marketing the potential of the country, I think the country sometimes continues to be portrayed uh, with images like samba and dancing and women and soccer and beaches, which is very nice for the tourist industry but maybe not the best thing to portray when you're trying to attract investors. I think we have much more to show than all this imagery. Uh, I think this imagery is all true, but I think we have to add to that and do what countries like maybe Chile is doing, that they market themselves much better despite being a tenth of the size 
and not having the kind of potential we have um, that, uh, that is just too big to miss. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay. Yep, it's on. So people would say, Carlos, that you're lucky. You're in a business where, you know, if things go well, people drink beer because they're happy. If things go badly, they drink beer to drown their Not sorrows. Not true. Not true. <laughs> so you've got a pretty stable selling, uh, selling uh, platform irrespective. Um, what would you say is the single thing the Brazilian government needs to do to improve the climate for business, including foreign business in Brazil? Well, of course, it's not true that beer sells, uh, no matter what, no matter what's happening, beer sells much better when people are feeling good about uh, their jobs, about their lives. They entertain more, they go out more often, they do everything more. So, if they're you know in doubt if they're going to have their job next month, they're they're doing everything less, including beer. So, so I I'd rather have the country growing, than and people happy than than the alternative. But to your question, I, I think that, uh, again, the things in Brazil, I think, are very sound compared to other countries in terms of institutions, rules. But two things I think could be better. I think rules could be more stable because I think what business people want, including ourselves who are there, is that the more stable the rules, the more confidence you have to invest because investments take years to mature, to pay back. So you want to be sure that if you're buying the concession for to build a, a highway, a freeway, that they won't take your ability to increase uh, tolls going forward or something to that sort, or that they will give free pass because you're 65 and older, like FIFA World Cup. You know, FIFA went to Brazil and they, the government wanted to, to, uh, to apply a law that exists in Brazil that students pay half price. And people that are older than 65, I think, also pay half price. And FIFA was saying, well, that was not in the business model when we came here. So I think rules being more stable, I think, is key. And I think infrastructure, the whole Brazil costs. I think infrastructure, security, um, uh, just getting things simpler. So, for example, we all know that, and again, I'm bullish on the country. I, I, I think um, it's an amazing country, but we all know that to open a company in Brazil takes 100 and plus days and to open a country in the U.S. takes two days and things like that. So I think there is a lot of things that can be uh, decomplexed. So uh, tax codes and I mean, in the U.S. the same thing. I mean, tax code here is amazingly complicated. Um, I mean, in Brazil, I used to, to, to file my personal tax code myself uh, via the Internet since the last 10, 15 years. And here in the U.S., I need an accountant to, to file my tax codes, and I file one per, per. So I came here to California. I need to file one for the state of California. I work two days in Missouri. I need to file one for Missouri. So my tax is like one federal plus 10 or 12 states that I worked a day here, two days there, three days there. So that's uh, we don't have that in Brazil. But on the company side, uh, it's very hard to to cope with all the the tax things and and, and filings and everything you need to do. So I think those that Brazil cost could be reduced uh, and uh, the rules could be even more stable. But again, the rule of law is there, the press is free, the institution is strong. So there's no government, I think, that will, will, will dial back a lot of the things that were conquered by the civil society. I think those things are well entrenched now and have a, um, a solid base. This is a little more specific. Um, you, you, you know, you sell beer as one thing. What, could you tell us about Brazil and its tastes that are different from other parts of the world, from your experience working internationally, and how you market things there differently from other parts of the world? Yeah, the, the amazing thing is that consumers are very similar. They're more similar than we think. Just like human beings are more similar than we think. I mean, I remember when I was at uh, at high school, we had a we had to choose our careers at some point through the end of high school. And in Brazil, you have to choose. It's not like in the U.S. where you do liberal arts 
and then towards the third year, fourth year, junior year, senior year, you do a major here, minor here, or you go to law school. No, you have to, to choose when you, at the age of 17, 18, you have to choose law school, engineering school, medical school, business school, you have to choose that. So we had a psychologist that was trying to help us, you know, think about our strengths, weaknesses, and all that. And at some point, I, he said something that caught my attention, and he said that we could all be bucketed in five or six buckets. And I was fr frustrated because I, I thought human beings were each one totally different from everybody else. And he said, Brito, if that was the case, psychologists and psychiatrists would have no job. Because the only way they can work is if they get Brito and they say, okay, the guy's a maniac, so let's put him in this bucket. And all maniacs tend to behave like this. They tend to have like this, and therefore the treatment is this, right? So I think consumers are the same thing. Consumers, we do consumer research everywhere. It's amazing to see how, especially today with global brands, how similar, more similar the tastes and aspirations are becoming. So um, difference between the male consumer and the female consumer, it's the same anywhere in the world. If they were a burka or if they were a veil or if they were nothing or, I mean, you can go anywhere. Men are much easier to please, much more predictable, much less sophisticated, much more brutal force, and women is all the opposite. It's complicated, it's sophisticated, it's full of tricks, and it's very hard to please. So that's anywhere in the world, it's the same. And I think the power of global brand, I, I, for, for example, I'll give you an example. We do a lot of market visits in, in, in my business. So we believe that the best way to really be, to lead the business is to know enough about the business to be able to ask good questions, relevant questions that will get good discussions going and to set the right targets. And for that, you need to know what's going on, right? So even as a CEO, I do a lot of market visits. And I remember a couple of years ago, I was here in San Francisco, taking advantage of one of the Stanford meetings here, went to visit the market here. And I went to a very popular place that was, had just been opened um, some months before. And I asked the guy, what was your thinking? I mean, how, how did you get to this mix of things that made it so popular? And the guy was saying, you know, my, my whole thing here was that I wanted to, to, to make this bar, a huge bar, like a, he took a warehouse and a huge bar, and uh, I wanted to be something that would attract women in the first place. And for that, I did market research, and I came with a list of 50 things that I needed to check the box, you know. So the bathroom has to be cleaner than anything else you could think of, and the windows had to be big because they wanted to see what was inside before they would come in. And the lighting has to do this and this, and the servers had to be the guys that were nice looking and knowledgeable. And the menu has to be very healthy, although they ask always for the unhealthy things, some of them, but they like to, to see that it's healthy. And uh, the assortment of beverages had to be amazing, although they ask 10 things, but they like to see the colors of on the back bar of all these things. And on and on and on, the list went, went. But then I had to attract the guys as well, right? Because, I mean, it's co-ed. An environment and I said okay and what do you do to attract the guys well first if the if the girls are here the guys will come so that's that that simple second I needed to have great beers and I need to have uh, sports TV on that's all I needed to attract the guys and for the women I mean the the the, the stool at the bar had to be a certain uh, height because they didn't like to be overlooked from you know too much from the top they'd like to be at the same thing a conversation the light had to be like this and the glass has to be like this so I mean Consumers are very similar, and the tastes are getting more and more global just because of global brands. Look at what you're wearing, what you're using to write, uh, your watch, your phone. I mean, everything's global but beer. So, but the beer tastes are global. So when you talk about the lager, lager is a lager. When you talk about an IPA, an IPA, an IPA, you have variations, but the tastes are very, they exist everywhere. Some countries, they are more like this. Uh, so, for example, in China, they like lighter beers. In the U.S., they also like lighter beers. By now, they're liking also the heavier beers. So, I mean, taste has changed. But one thing that you see everywhere is that people are going more and more towards a sweeter taste. And that, in our view, is because of the, all the soft years and years of drinking Pepsis and the likes, the Starbucks and the likes, not even coffee, tastes like coffee anymore, right? You, you go to Starbucks, it's, it lo looks like a milkshake, and they call coffee. A latte, whatever. So, I mean, the tastes are getting sweeter 
but it's uh, that's not a problem. Pallet's not a problem. I loved your metaphor about the Brazil chip and having been gone to Brazil many times since Castelo Branco's time in the beginnings of Brasilia, how would you contrast the Brazil chip from the American chip from the Portuguese chip? From the? I just, I, oh, the Portuguese chip. Because culturally, there may be some similarities. Yeah, Portuguese is... Uh... But, I just, but the, you, the chip is a great thought, but especially I want to know about how do you contrast the American chip from the Brazilian chip? I think the American chip, uh, if I were here to talk about the US, I'd be saying the same thing. That's why we came here. I, I, actually, the other day, I was in a meeting, can't remember which one, and people asked me about uh, the US and our view in the US, because in 2008, we acquired Budweiser uh, in the middle of the financial crisis, and it was a great thing we did. It paid big dividends for us, transformed our company. And I said, and it was a meeting where we had four or five CEOs plus other people, and uh, the, 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 the host asked each of us to say something at this dinner. And I was saying, everybody was American, leading American companies, global companies, but the American headquartered. I'm a Brazilian leading a Belgium headquartered company, uh, but my office is in, in New York. And I was saying, you know what, I'm not American. I was not born here. Our company was not initiated here. We elected to be here. We came here because we wanted to be here. And I think what's magical about the US is what we think made our company, which is the whole thing about people and culture. That's what made our company. When you ask how we built our company, three simple ideas. We had a big dream of doing something best in class, big dream. We thought big and we said, well, it's the same energy to think big or small, so let's think big. Think, the moment you think big, you, you put the bar high, you inspire people, you give them a sense of purpose. They want to be part and proud of it, to build that thing. Get the best people you can find, but more importantly, create an environment that they come and stay. Because a lot of people, a lot of companies attract very great talent, but they go after two years, or three or four years. We don't lose good people. And the third was this culture of ownership, this culture of really making decisions, knowing that you're going to live with those decisions. So culture and people and a big dream. And I think that's how this country was built, on the same premises. So the chip here in the US, some are trying to change it, but the chip that worked for so long is that uh, the American dream, if you work hard, you get there, the government's gonna, not going to be <laughs> blocking you. and. Uh, it's going to be small government, and each one will take care of itself. Not that you're selfish, not that there's nobody thinking about the community, but expect less from the government and do stuff more yourself. That's why I think you see so many charities here and people taking care of so many things that governments don't do because they don't expect the government to do something for them. That's what we say in our company. We say there's no such thing as the company. There's us. So don't tell me. What are they going to tell us to do? How are they going to figure out this out? What are they going to decide? It's us. We are the company. There's no such a thing in the, in the dark room called the company that you slip an envelope underneath the door with a, a question and the company answers you what to do. It's us, right? I think in Brazil the chip is that people expect more from the government, right? I think. I could be wrong. There are other Brazilians here. I think when I said, when I mentioned the chip, I was mentioning more the way you live there in terms of security. So, you know, you're not going to be biking around the city. You know, you're not going to be walking at night to go to a restaurant, depending on where you live. You know, you have to, to have cars that are more, you know, stronger, that are stronger cars. You have to live in gated communities. So, you know, but if you adapt to that, like when you go to Europe, uh, well, we moved from Canada to Belgium. And my wife, uh, who has been has lived most of her life here in the U.S. because of her, her dad and stuff, and she was saying, oh, Belgium has said, it's not better or worse. It's different. You have to take the chip and put on the chip. The parking lots are smaller. Everything is small. Everything is old. Everything is, I mean, everything is different. But the food's better and a lot of things. You know, the products are not all GMO. 
You know, you can taste the tomatoes, you can taste the things. So when I was referring to the chip, for each person it will be a different chip. But I think you can't compare. It's just different. It's a different experience. But if you're willing to make that transition, you can enjoy it, learn, have a great life. But if you say no, like Walmart said in 1994, we're going to conduct business in Brazil the same way we do it in the U.S. And of course it has to work. It didn't work. And then they changed the chip, uh, tried to understand how people thought and what was important for consumers and the, the fact that there was no credit. So the post-dated checks were, the, in fact, the credit. And then they are now very successful. So that was uh, what, what I was referring to. Brito, in a, in a conference like this, when you're talking about Brazil business and Brazil development operations there, can you tell us how a global company like uh, InBev can compare productivity margins when we operating in Brazil with oh, such a difficulties that you mentioned and also with such a, a very good things to other countries? In other words, how uh, an international company, an international company can proceed to the same productivity levels in Brazil as they have in the US or in China and keeping the same margins among those different markets in different countries? Well, uh, it's, it's a great question because I mean in Brazil, don't get me wrong, I mean people are very smart, uh, the people that work there and our efficiency levels in Brazil are very high. And that's why Brazil is used within our company a lot as a benchmark to efficiencies, be it in distribution, manufacturing, anything. So very smart people there that build a very um, a toolkit of best practices that we export. Okay, uh, But in a company like ours, we look at countries as a portfolio. So some countries have growth, not the margins. Some others have the margins, not the growth, and so on and so forth. So, And the beauty is having this balance between emerging and more mature. Because I remember when we, when we bought uh, Budweiser, a lot of our investors that have been with us for many years told us, wait a minute, with Budweiser, you're going to change from being 80% emerging markets to more of a 50-50 emerging and more mature established markets. Yeah, that's not good. And we said, you're American, you're European, we're Brazilians. We know that emerging markets, they do this. They do this. So I don't want to be 80% based on only emerging markets. I want to have a company that has some balance. Yes, they have growth, but they have also volatility. The other places have less growth or no growth, great margins, a great potential for up-trade consumers. They have consumers to drink the same but pay more, and they're more stable. So that's what you need. You need that portfolio play to have a business that will endure good days and bad days. So that's how we look at it. For example, if you look at our business in China, where we have 30,000 people, we have 36 breweries, okay? Uh, it's growing at 10%, 15% a year with margins much lower. That's a bet we have. We have a bet that that country, like Brazil was in 1989, that the margins were terrible, that as the country deregulates things and uh, the things that's more, the markets can move, that things will get to a better place. It's a bet. But because we're Brazilians, we've seen it before, we are betting that that could happen over there as well. Maybe for Swiss, it would be harder to place that bet because they haven't lived what we lived. Maybe the microphone's in the same place with my glasses, somewhere. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, huh? Yes. So um, I think I'm the token startupper in the room. And as such, I have two questions regarding, um, well, one is the influx of venture capital into Brazil, which about a year and a half ago was kind of, you know, the thing that was happening. Everyone was writing about Brazil. Yeah. Excel was going into Brazil. It was just the hottest thing ever. And then it just died out. And it ended up being chilly afterwards, and it just, you know, it keeps <laughs> moving. Um, so I was wondering if that affected innovation at all, if there were a lot more, a lot younger people starting companies, and if those companies got the funding, and if that funding actually helped them innovate. I know one of my good friends, who was a colleague, also an economics major, went back to Brazil to start a company, Ingresse, that's very successful now. That's my first question. And the second question is more related to, um, you know, the Twitter IPO stuff. I'm wondering, you mentioned a lot of research, and I'm wondering how and if you use social media to do that research. 
Oh yeah, no, no, no. So, social media today uh, is everywhere because uh, if you if you use social media to do conduct research, it's much faster, real time, cheaper. So you can you can access a larger pool of people. It doesn't work for everything because, for example, if you want to do a research on a sipping test for liquid, that won't work. But if you're talking about imagery and attributes and branding and what they think, how they compare different brands and what they think it's working the brand, what's not working, what should be added to a brand, then social media is a great place to do it. So for sure, we've been using a lot. And because I always say, I always tell our guys, if we were in the toilet paper business, it would be very hard to generate content. But because we are in the beer business and we sponsor everything that moves or sings or everything, we sponsor content for us and because content's key, today we consider ourselves also a little bit like Red Bull does, and Red Bull is best in class in that, a content factory. We have lots of content, and in social media, the way to hook and hold is with content. Otherwise, you just have fans, but they're not active. What's the most effective challenge? Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Oh, today, today it's, it's a mix of all these things. I mean, videos are also very, so your YouTube channels, also very important. Facebook's are very important. YouTube for us, uh, YouTube, no, uh, Twitter for us, less important. But uh, video became very important. So the whole thing about videos that go viral and blogs and things like that, that's, we pay a lot of attention to that. There are many metrics that are now, that you can use to monitor what's going on. And your first question about venture capital, I mean, I'm not the, the best to answer. What I know is that uh, investors are very, it's uh, greed and fear that they, that uh, governs their minds, so, and the herd instinct, right? That's what you learn in business school. So, when everybody's going to Brazil, venture capital, angels, investors, and families, and everybody's going there to invest, then you, you feel like, oh my God, everybody, I can't miss that. So, everybody's going. Then once the first one pulled the plug, then everybody says, well, maybe that's what we should do, and rethink this whole thing. Let's pull the plug. And that's when the best opportunities arise. So I know the guys from General Atlantic, which is a venture capital company, they have a different model, but they, 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 they help companies not be started, but they help companies globalize. They are as committed to Brazil as ever before because they are long-term long oriented. They don't have funds that need to be invested in five years or so. They, 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 they think like we do, long-term. So. It's great when you have a dream. That's why a dream is also important because then the bumps on the road don't affect you as much. If you don't have something that you're looking that's way over there, you just look at the bumps. And every bump will impress you a lot. Oh my God, look at this bump. But if you're looking you know, 10 years ahead, a bump is just part of getting there. And so I think investors in Brazil, they should think more long-term. Easy for me to say because we have a business there and we have experience there. But I think if you go back, you'll see that, yes, there was a downturn, but then there were years and years of upturn and then a little bit of a downturn. And then so average, it's up. Yes. I'd like to make a brief comment and then a question. Um, from my accident, you can tell that I'm coming from the beer capital of the world. Originally, indeed, Imbef bought our family business about a decade ago. And there, if you go through the annual reports, for the past 100 years, people are complaining about people drinking less and less beer. So that's just to counter that point that everybody always drinks more when things are good, so they were always complaining. The question, though, I wanted to ask is, you touched on this um, from a couple of angles, but maybe you can expand on it. You said Walmart. Um, when they went to Brazil, thought they'll do business the American way. Imbev has always prided itself in being local and understanding the local culture. Um, if you can give kind of tips to an American enterprise, or international enterprise that wants to do business in Brazil, what are the sort of things that they should consider about Brazil? How would it be easier to do Brazil, um, to to not have the typical traps in Brazil? Um, kind of a couple of other points other than than just what you mentioned about Walmart. How can one? Um, succeed in Brazil. Are there some other simple tips or hints that you might have for business? Well, I, I, I can talk, I, hard for me to put myself in their shoes, but I can talk about how we do it when we go to a new country. I mean, when we go to a new country, for us, everything's about people. So that's the first thing we do. So how can we find some great people on the ground that we can attract, retain, immerse in our culture, 
trust us people. So they help us understand the market, competition, consumers, access to point of sales, brands, and everything else. But for us, it's always it starts with people. If you don't have people on the ground, then you're just reading reports from other companies that you sent there, as opposed to you going there. We believe in going there and smelling and touching and seeing what's going on for your own eyes. I think that's the first thing. So we try in the place where we have business to have lots of local local people in our management teams and our leadership teams as much as possible. At first you go, of course, with the head guy is always somebody that comes from a different country to start the business there, to spearhead the efforts. But as soon as possible, we would try to get local people involved because at the end of the day, they know the market better than we do. And if they buy into how we do things, more, for us much more important than what we do, then that's the way we start. Very, I'm sure I didn't answer your question, but I think it's, uh, it starts with people, uh, people you can trust that buy into the way and how you do things, and they will translate things for you in a much better and unbiased way. That's how we start. And then what we do is we export the brands to the country. We start seeding brands before we commit. So we start in a, what we call an asset light model. Then when we have some critical mass, then we commit capital. But first is the people. Then it's like prototyping. So you start seeding. And then you learn. And then you commit. And I'm not saying it's a recipe 100% will get you there. But that's what works for us going to new markets, white territories. Well, we're doing extremely well. Uh, Do one time here? No, uh, oh, no this is be important. quick, be quick. Do the Clydesdales go everywhere? Yeah, okay. they're now going to China because next yeah. year, next year will be the year of the horse in China. <laughs> and Budweiser is the number one premium beer in China. Right. National brand, number one premium beer. And uh, the year of the horse next year. There so they're going to China. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Carlos, we, uh, we do have a presentation for you, and it's exactly the ideal one, because I, 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 I see that you don't have a tie. Yeah. <laughs> this tie is the building tie. Oh, I see. So this is the gun building tie. Um, we tend to wear it on these sorts of occasions, and we hope that you'll have occasion to wear this next time you come to Stanford. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.